So good afternoon, and welcome to our event, Neil Brandeisian Antitrust, Repeating History's Mistakes. We seem to be far too good at that these days. I'm Mark Jamison. I'm a non-resident senior fellow with the American Enterprise Institute. On July 9th, 2021, President Joe Biden declared that the past 40 years of American antitrust have been a failed experiment. Now, why, according to the president? Well, he, he said that prices for things like prescription drugs, hearing aids, internet service are just too high, and wages are too low. Okay, so what's the cause of that? Well, he said that was pretty easy. That was big pharma, big agriculture, big tech, big pretty much anything else, except for big government. And as I understand what he was saying, is that American businesses need to be smaller, at least in his opinion. When he made this announcement, he was flanked by members of his cabinet, by the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, and by the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission. The symbolism of the chairman of Federal Trade Commission's presence, Lena Kahn, was important because she's been an outspoken person for what's called the Neo-Brandeisians. This is a group who want to turn back the clock on antitrust. They're the ones who say the past 40 years have been a, a failed experiment. They want to go back to the days of Louis Brandeis, where they pick up their name. He was very much against large businesses. He was very much against large government. And he was also very much against consumers doing shopping for good prices or good products. He thought that was a total waste of time. The, um, the Neo-Brandeisians are also against large business. They're not so much against large government, and their relationship with consumers is a little complicated. Um, but the question today is, are those really the good old days of antitrust? Were there really good reasons for leaving behind the mantra that big business is bad or, or a curse? As Timothy Wu has said, he's a White House advisor. What are the metrics that we should use to measure success or failures in antitrust and who wins and who loses if we roll back the clock? Here to discuss this with us today are two former chairpersons of the Federal Trade Commission, Deborah Platt Majoris and Timothy Burris. Mr. Burris led the agency from 2001 to 2004 and was director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection from 1981 to 83, and the Bureau of Competition from 83 to 85. He's a foundation professor with the Antonin Scalia Law School and is a senior visiting fellow with the American Enterprise Institute. Tim is currently counsel, a senior counsel, with Sidley Austin. Ms. Majoris led the FTC from 2004 through 2008. She then joined Procter & Gamble as Senior Vice President and General Counsel, and from 2010 through 2022, she served as the company's Chief Legal Officer and Secretary. She was recently named to the Board of Directors of American Express, and has also served as a non-governmental advisor to the International Competition Network, an informal international network of antitrust authorities and experts. So Tim and Deborah, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Tim, let me start with asking you. You've done extensive research, some recent research, that, in my opinion, is the most in-depth analysis of the legal path that we've taken and the intellectual path we've taken from the very first days of antitrust through the Brandeis years uh, to the modern day today. So what do you make of Mr. Biden's speech and the movement that it represents? Well, first, thank you, Mark, uh, for hosting, and thanks to AE, I mean, thank you for moderating, thanks to AEI for hosting, and thanks especially uh, to Debbie, my longtime friend and colleague, uh, for, for participating. Uh, Debbie and I uh, have been involved uh, over much of the 40 years, uh, and uh, uh, we'll talk a lot about that today, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, to answer Mark's question, Look, President Biden ran as a moderate, uh, and his views and the views of his administration on antitrust are anything but, but moderate. What Debbie and I were involved in, in, the, in, in at least the 30, 30 of the 40 years, the last 30, 
uh, was a bipartisan island in what was often a very contentious Washington Sea. Uh, take, for example, the Obama administration's 2010 merger guidelines. Now, those guidelines set concentration levels that were much more permissive for mergers than the Reagan administration's guidelines. But nobody, nobody in the press, nobody in Congress, really very few people in the academic world batted an eyelash about that. You know, the conservative, so-called conservative administration was, was much harsher than the, than the liberal administration. Uh, the reason that the change was made was uh, over time, application of the, of, of the merger guidelines was shown that, that, the, that the standards set in 2010 were, were appropriate. Uh, but yet, in condemning the 40 years in President Biden's speech, he turned in a different direction. Remember, in those 40 years, 16 of them were Clinton and Obama. Ob uh, I'm sorry, President Biden did not turn to anyone from those two administrations to run his antitrust uh, departments or the CFPB or his White House advisor. All four of those jobs went to individuals who just a few years ago would have been regarded uh, uh, as outside the mainstream. Indeed, when you listen to those appointees, they reserve some of their harshest criticism for those two Democratic administrations. Uh, perhaps they think of we Republicans as, as, as lost causes. Uh, now, this doesn't mean that there wasn't disagreement uh, before 2021. Uh, there was often disagreement, sometimes acrimonious. It, often uh, it was about cases. But there was agreement on the approach. The approach was that the North Star of antitrust was the consumer, and that economics should guide uh, how we approached cases. Uh, that's, that's not what the neo-Brandesians do. Uh, and that is a sea change. Yeah. So, Deborah, what would you add to that? Yeah, I would add that one of the things that I've been searching for in the in the approach that um, that this group really wants to take is if you pull away from the consumer welfare standard that we've been using for all these years, and you stop this um, approach using economics and empirical data and evidence then to what are you tethered? And I don't know other than personal belief and, um, and, and some assumptions that I haven't been able to see the backing for, um, how that's tethered. And the problem with that, and actually, you know, when you're in enforcement, you see how easy that this can be to happen. The sort of, but we'll know it when we see it, okay? Um, the big problem with we know it when we see it is this. Um, and won't surprise you, you, you know, given how I've just spent um, the last 14, year, 14 years since I left the FTC, and that is this. The first line of defense for antitrust resides in the businesses and, um, and, the, and the business folks in sales and marketing together with their in-house lawyers. And, um, I mean, that's just a fact, and people um, who are in enforcement might not like to think of it that way, but... Um, but we have to be able to react to the, case, the cases that are brought, the cases the courts decide, and of course what, um, what the enforcers are doing and what they're saying. And, and so, so just think about Procter & Gamble for a minute. So does business in 180 countries with scores of different product markets, 100,000 employees, um, and, and I can't be sitting next to them all the time saying, no, you can't do this or you can't do that, or that might be viewed. No, I mean, we have to put in place guardrails and guidelines so that business can our business can compete aggressively but stay within very reasonable bounds of compliance. Very difficult to do that um, when, um, when suddenly all of this precedent that's been built up is being thrown out. Now, I think the courts will have their way with that, and Tim, you probably saw that just today. I heard about that. The announcement that the, that the FTC lost a merger case they brought where Meta was, um, was making an acquisition, an acquisition, attempting to make an acquisition. So the courts are going to have something to say about this, because the other thing that's happened in this 40 years, of course, is that precedent has been built up 
very supportive of using the consumer welfare standard, using economics. Um, so I just, I just worry very much about what it means to just wholesale throw it out. Um, and I'll just say one more thing, mm -hmm. if, I, if I might, Mark. And, and Tim, this is something that Charles James taught me when we got into the administration in 01, because before FTC, I was at the antitrust division at Justice, my first role. And I worked for Charles James, a great friend of Tim's, who used to work for Tim. And he, he's probably one of the most conservative antitrust theorists I know, one of the smartest as well. But what he told us immediately was this. We do not blow up the cases that were brought by the Clinton administration, because that's not good for antitrust enforcement. It's not good for the certainty that's needed. It's not good for the credibility of it. So we took forward cases that had been brought that we might not necessarily have viewed the facts the same way and, and the law the same way, but we brought those cases forward. That has stuck with me. And so I worry, too, about that credibility now as I see um, all of us, I guess, being, being thrown under the bus for, for how, uh, how uh, bad we were. So, Tim, I want to go back and pick up a couple of things that, that uh, Debbie was talking about. And, and Debbie, I'd like for you to chime in as well. So one of the things that you made explicit, Debbie, is that if you roll back the clock 60, 80 or so years, there was an underlying philosophy of antitrust, a little hard to get your head around sometimes, a little vague. But then there was this idea that really antitrust is about the consumers. So I'd like to somebody to describe that. Um, but then also the importance of the, the horizontal merger guidelines. That's maybe jargon, sound like jargon to some people, but it's a set of guidelines that the Department of Justice and the FTC use to say, here's how we're going to assess whether or not something is harmful. Um, which of you would like to kind of describe the history and which would you like to talk about the importance of the guidelines? You're the history expert. Well, the original guidelines in 1968 were, were schizophrenic in the sense that they, they were done by Don Turner, who was an economist. And he tried to implement the economics of the day, uh, which turned out to have been overthrown by the so-called Chicago School. But because there were a lot of bad court decisions, he also had to write, he wrote two sections of the guidelines. One was for so-called concentrated markets. And that was, implemented this, this idea, the this simple market concentration doctrine uh, that comported with the, with the populist idea that, that big was bad. But it was only if in markets with relatively few people. The problem was he also had to add a section in unconcentrated markets because the Supreme Court wrote a, a bunch of decisions in the, in, the, in the 1960s, this was the Warren Court, that essentially said that even a moderately sized business could not merge with a, you know, with a business. Uh, and it led uh, famously Justice Potter Stewart to say the only consistency in the case is that the, is that the government always wins. It, it went so poorly uh, or so crazily that in a, in a mid-1960s case, the Vons case, the Supreme Court wrote an ode to small businesses. Uh, and that owed, uh, they stopped the merger in Los Angeles. We had moved to Southern California. We moved to San Diego in, in that time period. I was born in Northeastern Ohio. Uh, and it, it, it's a booming economy, lots of people moving in, lots of stores coming, and there was a merger between two, two stores that had a market share of 7.5%. And the Supreme Court stopped the merger because the number of single grocers, sing, one store grocers, had decreased from, from several thousand to about half that size. And that, you know, it was, an, again, it was an ode to some time that hadn't existed for many, many years and, and was never going to exist again. My grandfather in, in uh, Northeastern Ohio had, had such a store. Uh, but it was, it, it, it was, 
made no sense, but the 68 guidelines were forced to include an attack on those mergers. To end the history, the Reagan administration came in and in 1982 wrote a set of guidelines that in many ways uh, their basic concepts still reign, uh, uh, said we're going to look at economics, we're going to look at consumers. Uh, the Obama administration did make the change that I mentioned of, of saying that, that uh, we're going to look in, we're, we're going to let mergers go uh, unless the market is, is, is really concentrated. <coughs> but you had this change over time from, uh, uh, from a populist approach uh, to, uh, to the modern approach. And at the same time, and th this is more complicated, the economists changed their views as well. The economists in the 60s were really concerned about concentration at levels that nobody would be concerned about, no economist would be concerned about now. I mean, those are levels where, you know, if you had, if you didn't have 10 firms or so in the market, they would be worried. Uh, economists changed their minds about that. Uh, uh, and, and so you had, uh, because of the economics, uh, changes that now these neo Brandesians want to go back, and but it's not based on economics. It's based on, as Debbie says, it's hard to know what it's based on, but it's certainly partly based on this simple idea of big is bad. Yeah, and just to quickly build on sure. that for your question about how, you know the consumer, um, I'll probably you know just to try to shorthand it, Tim, I might butcher this a little bit, but really the, you know what the learning was over time is that. Um, yeah, when you focus on individual competitors, um, uh, as the courts were doing at that time, when he talks about the Vons case, and as the FTC was doing at the time, um, you don't get you don't get the result you want. You don't actually get more competition. You get um, less efficient firms operating in the market. Um, the more efficient firms um, uh, can be hurt. Consumers can pay more. And so, so this focus, hey, if we focus on the consumer, and for years we've said, we're not here to protect competitors, we're here to protect competition. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about it that way, and that has one other advantage that I'll just note that I've sort of learned over the years, and I, saw, I see it with other jurisdictions too, including the EU. When you have this relentless focus on competitors and trying to save them, the whole thing becomes much more political much more subject to the political process. Because think about it. Every one of those firms can lobby, which it did, to get the, Rob the robbins Patman Act, which I think we're going to talk about. But, um, but, but honestly, I'm not saying it's not politicized at all. And unfortunately, I think gets more so as a lot of things do. But the, but the fact of the matter is, keep the focus on the consumer. And you have less of There's just less of that. So, Well, before we get to the robinson Patman Act, let me ask you, you worked in a business for a number of years. And in my day job, I trot around the world teaching governments why it's important to have very clear regulations. And it's because businesses need to understand you know, how they're going to be judged. Mm -hmm. And that's what the merger guidelines give us. So tell me how, from your perspective, is mm -hmm. all this important to a business so they can plan? Yeah, it's, it's extremely important. You know, look, most, most mergers, if they're going to die, they die in the conference room floor. Um, in the corporation. They really do. I mean, um, uh, in-house counsel and with, together with outside counsel and economists are, are killing them all the time, right? <laughs> Taking a look, saying here's, um, here's what the guidelines say, here's what the recent precedent is. So extremely important because if you think about it, I mean, certainly to a company like Procter & Gamble, that's not true of all companies, but most mergers are not essential to a company like that, right? I mean, they might say, hey, this acquisition could help us here or where, but, but most of them are not essential. So most companies simply do not want to waste their time, effort, and money, um, and, and not to mention, no one really likes to tangle with the federal government mm -hmm. uh, or the states um, if you don't have to. So you'd rather have this guidance and be able to at least you know, make that prediction. So the clearer, the better. And yes, the guidelines have to be updated over time um, to reflect current any, um, antitrust and economic thinking. But they can't be updated at every new administration. And in fact, today, um, you know, just talking to a lot of um, uh, council and banks, there's a lot of either confusion out there right now or just flat out don't even try mm -hmm. to do a merger because um, it's not going to happen. And you know, part of what they're being advised is 
just be willing to litigate because the courts will apply a lot of the precedent from the past, but that takes a lot of resources and a lot of um, time and attention. Okay. So Tim, eventually I want to talk about mergers. Before, I want to talk about this, this Robinson-Patman Act. So this was in 1936, and it's played a really central role in antitrust for a number of years. Um, but Tim, in his research, has a very interesting quote about it. He says, it's the most widely condemned statute in antitrust legislation's long history. That's not very kind. Um, but it's openly praised by the current chair of the Federal Trade Commission and one of her Democrat colleagues. Now, Deborah, you experienced the consequences because you were in Procter & Gamble, and it's, uh, its space is one of the things targeted in the act. Explain the act to us, what it did, and the dangers of embracing it. Yes, yeah, so briefly, and there's a great description of it in its history in Tim's paper, so I commend that to you. But look, um, I would say <laughs> it's embarrassingly anti-competition statute that really just gets lumped in with other antitrust laws that are pro-competition. Um, it was openly conceived as an attack on low prices. Um, and when I was uh, chairing the FTC, I called for its repeal. You can see how effective I was. Uh, it's, still, <laughs> it's still on the books. But look, so it was passed to protect traditional retailers because, from chain retail stores, namely A&P. You may remember the A&P, ironically, no longer exists. Um, but um, but it, it, it had come in and was innovating on, on business strategy, using strategies of vertical integration, um, collecting data on consumers, um, economies of scale, and, um, and for, and, uh, you know, understandably on a personal basis for traditional small retailers, for wholesalers who were getting cut out as middlemen, that was tough. Um, and, so, um, and so they went to Congress and said, this has to stop. Um, we can't compete. Uh, with this um, if they lower the prices to the consumers this much. So that's really w why the robinson patman Act, I mean, I'm shortening it, Tim, but that's why it was passed. And what does it do? Well, it, it, um, it's a law against price discrimination. So it was very poorly written. It's very vague. But basically, in essence, it's a supplier must charge the same price to each and every customer for the same Good, for the same goods, generally. Um, the problem with that is that the research shows that that increases prices <laughs> to consumers um, because you're basically attacking them and you're saying, um, I have to charge Walmart the same price that I might hire, uh, that I might charge a corner store. So that's what it does. Mm -hmm. um, and so just quickly, what's it, what's it like? So it hasn't been enforced since, what? I mean, one it has, case in the it Reagan hasn't been, administration? It hasn't been seriously enforced yeah, for 50 years it so, hasn't been at the FTC. At the FTC. Yeah. But states have, some states have many RP acts. There's some private right of action. Um, and of course, you never, it's still in the books, so you never know when it can come back. So when you're a company, um, you can't, because of what I said before, you just can't make monumental shifts all the time. Okay, don't worry about that now. Worry about this. You, you, and especially when you do business in, in, in so many countries around the world, the approach we tried to take was, look, here, here's how to develop good antitrust instincts in your business people, and here's how to know when to ask a question on perhaps a complicated marketing scheme or what have you, um, and you just can't shift. So basically, we, um, we followed it, um, and retailers want, want to distinguish themselves. If they can't do it on price, they want to differentiate your product on some, some other way. So we're doing all kinds of machinations to uh, you know, come up with different sizes for, you know, for Costco or for Walmart or what have you um, uh, to, not, to not run afoul of the act. Um, so it's very costly, um, a lot of work um, for, um, I wouldn't even say a little gain for you know, quite possibly um, um, doing damage. And um, so as you can see, I, I'm not a fan. <laughs> um, and I worry a lot that returning to this is just going to get us even more cost, higher prices for consumers, and a lot more, and a lot more confusion. Because even if, even if it does come back, Tim, I don't, think, I don't think it'll stick going forward. I could be wrong about that part. Tim, what would you add? Well, I, look, I think it's useful to think about some of this history to see what an anachronism the Robinson-Patman Act 
was and, and, and is, it, it, in, it was called the original version, the, the, the Wholesale Grocers Protection Act because it was, it was written by their lobbyist. And it was written, as, as Debbie said, it, was, it, it followed the, the Roosevelt administration. This is the FDR, not, not, not the Teddy Roosevelt administration. Their first plan to combat the Depression was to raise prices. And they had something called the, the, the NRA, the National Recovery Administration. And the National Recovery Administration had these, the, Business groups got together and they and they agreed on they cartelized they agreed on these codes, and the codes were blessed by the government, uh, and they had codes that 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 raised prices and they essentially some of those codes really tried to hurt the the new chain stores. The chain stores were hated. Uh, Huey Long uh, had said there was no place in Louisiana. Uh, for the a and and other chains. The Nazis even hated the chains in Germany. And what happened was the Supreme Court uh, held in a case that people still read in law school, the sick chicken case, the Schechter poultry case. It, in 1935, in May of 1935, it said it was unconstitutional. 11 days later, this original version of Robinson Patman was, was introduced by, by Patman, and then a few weeks later by, by Robinson in the Senate. Uh, that version, and this is crucial because people will tell you, including the Neo Brandesians, when Robinson Patman stopped being enforced, that was thwarting congressional intent. Well, what happened is that they couldn't get the law passed that would have really thwarted the chains. Instead, they wrote another law that was ambiguous, self-contradictory, subject to multiple interpretations. And that law is the law the FTC grabbed and ran with. Uh, that law does not have to be interpreted the way the FTC interpreted it for decades. The courts uh, uh, interpreted it much more sensibly. It still should be repealed. Uh, but it's, it, it, it's not nearly uh, uh, as crazy uh, uh, as those original interpretations was. But just to show you the changes, the a and is this vilified, hated thing in the mid-30s. By 1961, uh, the, I mean, the a and is, is, for 40 years, uh, ending in the mid-60s, the largest retailer in the United States. The young John Updike in 1961 fresh from writing what's probably the greatest sports essay in history about Ted Williams' last at bat. That's the one where he says that gods don't answer letters when he refused to tip his cap. He hit a home run in his last at bat. He writes this short story that everybody in my generation, Debbie was spared this, has to, had to read in high school. And he's looking for a symbol of the culture of middle class 20th, mid 20th century America. And so he sets the story and he calls the story simply A and P. Uh, and that shows you know, what happened is people adjusted. And they adjusted because the chain stores were a good thing. And they were especially a good thing for less wealthy people for whom the stuff sold in the chains was a bigger part of their budget. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, I learned this saga 45 years ago as a young uh, uh, FTC staffer. I taught it in my classes. Uh, as it became irrelevant, all that stuff went down in my basement. Uh, and it became relevant again uh, with the Neo Brandesians. I suppose I should, I should thank them in a sense for making all this old knowledge in my mind some, you know, you know relevant again. But until until they appeared, you would have had to search the antitrust world with, a, with the proverbial lamp looking not for the honest individual, but for someone who liked the, this most vilified statute. And finally, in these recent years, they would have found, they would have found those people, unfortunately. So Tim, let me now go to the merger policy issues. 
So companies seek to merge for lots of different kinds of reasons. Some nefarious, some, some quite, uh, quite positive. So let me pick, on, pick up a, a quote from Ms. Khan um, that you have in your research. In, in her, this particular quote, she's referring to the merger guidelines that we've already discussed. And this is a September 2022 speech. And you quote her as saying that she's working on modifying these merger guidelines as a matter of fidelity to the law, something you've already referred to a little bit. And she claims that the FTC and the DOJ began straying from, this, from law about 40 years ago, when President Biden says, and she argues that the agencies have sidestepped controlling precedent and the statutory text by administrative fiat. Now that's pretty damning, but you were part of this history of the sidestepping. So I was wondering what you think of her comments and what do, what do they mean? What's their implications? Well, she, she's talking about those cases that I mentioned uh, you know, 10 minutes ago or so. But look, this is emblematic of how the populists argue. They use sound bites that, that don't withstand you know, detailed analysis, but in the, in, in the popular culture uh, with you know, con congressional staffers and reporters uh, who, who don't have the time or, or interest to do that kind of analysis, uh, the, they seem to work. Unfortunately, uh, Chair Khan, in this particular case, did something different. Uh, she added, uh, you know, she went a step further and cited uh, a case that one can rebut quickly, and I'll explain that. She cited a, a 1986 opinion from Judge Richard Posner. And Dick Posner, who himself is an FTC alum, he said in an FTC case, the FTC, it's a merger case, the FTC refused to rely on these old cases. And, and gee, aren't they making it harder for themselves? And Chair Khan stops there, okay, implying that Judge Posner, very famous judge, Chicago judge, written thousands of opinions. I spent a lot of time, one of the smartest people I've ever known, a, a, an anecdote about it. He, he's on a plane after a long conference and, and uh, a friend of mine was explaining this and, and, and the friend is reading a light novel and Posner is laughing because he's reading uh, 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 Euripides in the original Greek. <laughs> uh, but Posner had uh, Chair Khan or whoever helped her with this read two paragraphs further. Posner said it was prudent not to rely on those cases and the reason it was prudent was because modern law, you know, 20 years later, this is 1986, modern law wasn't focused on competitor protection like the law of the 60s. It was focused on the consumer. Well, we're now 30 years after that, and the law, the Supreme Court, although it has not decided, I mean, the, you know, the, the chair can say these cases have never been overruled, and they haven't. But the Supreme Court has decided case after case after case in antitrust law, which rejects the populist thinking of the 1960s in favor of the com consumer focus of, of those alleged failed uh, uh, 40 years. And if you look at the statute itself, the, the merger statute says simply, and I'll quote it, uh, it looks at the effect where it may, quote, may be substantially to lessen competition or to tend to create a monopoly. The neo-Brandesians claim that that statute is being usurped. Well, that statute is, is of course, subject to multiple readings, including the reading uh, that what you ought to do is look at, at, at the effect on consumers. Uh, and that's what happened uh, in those 40 years, uh, rather than the populism of the, uh, of the Warren court. Last point is, and this, this, this is really odd, odd to me, uh, and maybe it's because of, I'm, I'm old and remember this particular history. They love to cite uh, Cicilline, a chair, when he was chairman, did this. Uh, Lena Khan does this. The, a lot of the legislative history of, of the modern merger law, which was passed in 1950, 
was driven by a 1948 FTC study that said concentration was increasing and it was because of mergers. Well, that study was bullshit. It was wrong, and bullshit's a lawyer term of art. Yeah. <laughs> and, and economists it, don't use that term. Economists <laughs> don't use it. And, and it, was, it was wrong, and it was shown uh, by an article published right when the statute passed. The authors of the FTC admitted in a hand-waving article, at, at the end of the article, there's a footnote that essentially admits they're wrong. The neo-Brandesians still quote this study today. Uh, and there's a similar debate going on about whether concentration is increasing today. And the literature is no better for the idea that the concentration is increasing than it was uh, back you know, 70, uh, 70 years ago. So Deborah, what would you add? I mean, it's sort of cute, but it's just not credible to say that for 40 years we've just been sidestepping precedent and not following the law. Um, for all the reasons that Tim, that Tim said. And I think it's also important if you don't do merger law to understand, wow, all these years, I mean, why no, why wouldn't the Supreme Court decide a single merger case? Well, it really goes back to, in part, what I said earlier. Um, think about the years it would take, and your case couldn't be mooted to get to the Supreme Court on a merger um, today. Um, it would take a long time, and, um, and we just, we just move too fast in, in the world and in business state. No one takes on that. You know, I, I always say, wouldn't it be great if someone in the corporate would take one for the team and take it all the way and let's, you know, let's get this officially overturned. Um, it just hasn't happened. The other reason it hasn't happened is because much of merger um, precedent actually um, has been done by consent decrees, um, not not by cases. There are um, merger cases that still get litigated, a few. There are more now because, um, because both the antitrust division and the FTC are bringing more cases right now, um, many of which they've lost, I think for the reason I said before, which is courts are using the past precedent. Um, but, um, but, but because of those two reasons, we just, we're just, I don't know that we'll ever get another merger case to the Supreme Court, um, but, but to think that any of these people honestly believe that any court would allow them to block a merger with combined market share of four, five, seven percent? I mean, that's that's not reality, and and uh, you know everybody knows it. So um, so it's uh, you know one has to be careful on these issues. But one of the things that I have loved about antitrust law over the years is the way that within, within bounds, always with this consumer welfare standard to keep us honest, um, the new learnings about markets and our experience with enforcement does come into play and does get included in enforcement, at least up till now, and, and in the way precedent gets developed. And because ec um, economies are dynamic, not static, it just has to be that way, within bounds. Well, let me get to one more topic, then I want to turn to the audience for, for questions. Um, as you know, in the policy arena or in the courtroom or in a newspaper, every good story needs a villain. In the case of antitrust, um, President Biden implied it, the Neil Brand, the Isians have been very explicit that the, the villain is a bunch of ideologues associated with the University of Chicago. And I was just, you know, well, I've studied the history, I think that's a strained reading of history, but that's just my opinion. What are your thoughts on that? Um, what are its implications? Its validity and its implications? I know, I was thinking about that. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a new form of identity politics, right? Just you know, call someone uh, in, in today's administration, call someone, oh, from the Chicago school, and especially when you, when you put Judge Bork's name next to it and suddenly it's, ah, it must be, it must be bad. So, um, but but the but think, look the the Chicago School of Economics um, has added tremendously over these forty or so years to um, to the policy debates and to um, and to getting to the consumer welfare standard. There's no question about that. Um, but what's fascinating about making them into the villa is that the fact into the villain is that the facts just don't you know support this kind of good versus evil. And the reason for that is first of all. The, the, the biggest bad school of thought was, uh, was being um, attacked 
well before um, uh, these Chicago thinkers came onto the scene, um, and for, for very good reason. In fact, even the Justice Department, as Tim says in his paper in 1977, wrote a scathing report about the FTC's enforcement on Robinson Patman and the like. So, um, so that's not the case. But then if you bring it more to the present, um, it's really what Tim said, this bipartisan um, consensus that we've had that is, again, not everybody agreeing all the time on particular cases or, um, or, or directions, but within a, within a band um, and with consumer welfare as the, as the touchstone, um, you have um, huge influence coming from what we call the Harvard School. So Phil Arita, who wrote and co-wrote the most, perhaps, are they the most influential antitrust sure. treatises in, yep. um, in history? Um, coming, coming from the Harvard School. Um, um, Justice Breyer um, came out of that school himself, wrote some very influential antitrust opinions um, that threw out the big is bad. And bringing it closer to today, I mean, Carl Shapiro, who is probably the most influential uh, economist in both the Clinton and Obama administrations, who's out of Berkeley, um, uh, is very much, and, and he, he wrote, did he write the 2010? He really wrote the 2010 merger He's guidelines. Very influential, right? He would never call himself a Chicago school theorist, and yet um, he's been very influential in this time, and and very much his writings uh, are are consonant with the with the consumer welfare standards. So it's just wrong mm -hmm. to say it that way. It's kind of soundbitey, like Tom's, like um, like Tim said, um, and um, and then of course I'll let Tim comment now. But the you know the the other uh, the other thing is that. Even within the, the Chicago School, it, it's not like everyone was always agreeing on everything. I mean, there's a wide there's a wide range here, and um, um, and the key is to for enforcers to put it together in a way that it's predictable uh, for business, and and uh, um, and um, if you're not going to improve the economy, at least don't hurt it. Yeah. So anyone who reads Thomas Sowell knows there were lots of fights within the Chicago School. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Tim, what would you add? Well, look. You, I agree with, with, with both Mark's introduction and what Debbie's saying. M Mark's point about the need for villains is, is clearly right. And who better uh, than that bearded Rasputin, as I heard one young Neo Brandesian say, who obviously had never seen a picture of the original Rasputin, uh, uh, you know, called Bob Bork. Uh, and of course, you know, his notoriety. Uh, was not about antitrust. Uh, the reason he's, he, he makes a good villain was the whole, the whole contretemps over the Supreme Court. Uh, Debbie mentioned the, the, uh, the Harvard School. Justice Breyer was enormously important. He's so important that when he is, uh, when he's nominated for the Supreme Court, Ralph Nader and Lloyd Constantine, if you know anything about antitrust, you know Lloyd Constantine's a really big deal. They show up and say, you can't put this guy in the court because of his antitrust views. Uh, and his antitrust views were extremely important. If you talk to clerks over the, over the tenure, there are many, many, many important antitrust decisions. While Steve Breyer was there, he didn't write most of them, but he was the, he was the mover. I met him in 1975 uh, when he was convincing Ted Kennedy to support deregulation of transportation, especially airlines. That is another thing that if you look at the president's executive order, that they want to undo transportation deregulation. Uh, and uh, so Breyer, uh, 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 who the Republic, I was in a meeting in 1980 in the, in the transition uh, where the idea of putting Breyer on the first circuit was what was greeted enthusiastically by a lot of a lot of Republicans because of things like transportation because of his uh, uh, Steve Breyer was a law and economics guy and obviously he was uh, he, he was a you know a liberal justice in a lot of ways but in these in these business issues uh, uh, he was uh, he was a leader and, and he was very good. <laughs> Deb, Debbie alluded to uh, uh, a very important point about Chicago, and, and I, I, I put it this way. 
the Chicago School, and we're talking about now 50 and 60 years ago, these people were criticized. They're like the revolutionaries of 1776, okay? They agree on getting rid of the British, okay? They don't agree on what the government should look like afterwards. And one of the best examples of that is merger policy. If you take three Chicago giants, two of them we've talked about, uh, uh, actually we talked about them all. You, talk, you take Bork, Posner, and Baxter. They have completely different views about what to do about mergers. Bork is four to three, and, and any mergers with more competitors are fine. Posner is completely uh, more aggressive than that. You couldn't get more aggressive. He says any merger that, 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 that will make uh, 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 increased concentration to where you've got a four firm CR, which is the way they talked about it before Herfindahl's, 60% or greater, that should be presumptively illegal. That, that can't be any further from Bork. Bill Baxter, who had the pin in the 82 guidelines, is, is in between, although, although much closer to Bork, uh, where he made, he made six to five, the, 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 the presumptive illegality. And it's moved to four to three, in the marginal case, I mean. It's moved to four to three in the, uh, uh, in, in the Obama guidelines. It's true with predatory pricing in other areas. The Chicago people were focused on winning the war not on the government to follow. Uh, and the last point is the demise of Robinson Patman, which is extremely important in antitrust history. The leaders of that came before the Chicago School. A guy named Fred Rowe, who just recently died, uh, he started as a student in 1950. Uh, Don Turner. Uh, uh, was very uh, uh, was wrote a very important article as another guy as a student in 1949. Bob Petoskey, my longtime friend and predecessor as chair, who did not like the Chicago School or criticized the Chicago School, had a very important role in the demise of the Robinson Patman Act. Uh, so you know the the idea uh, that that there's these Chicago villains who are responsible for the for the 40 years is is a neo-Brandesian fantasy. All right, well, thank you so much for your comments. Let's now turn to the audience. If you have questions, comments, raise your hand, and we have a microphone. So right up here in front, Matt. My name is Joe Freeman. I'm what's euphemistically called a content producer. And uh, content, the income of content producers has been significantly downgraded by the big four tech firms, and I didn't hear you mention them at all. I'm a member of two writers' organizations, and their surveys show that the median income of full-time working writers is half what it was 20 years ago. I think Brandeis would have broken these people up, especially Amazon. How come, what, what, you know, say something about them. What would you do with them? All right. Who would like to answer that? Well, well first of all, um, and I don't, look, I'm not trying to be too cute about this, but I'll tell you what I said the day that I got sworn in as chair of the FTC. I turned to the team and I said, the only thing I care about, I have no preconceived personal views other than um, I'm a practitioner. We follow the law. We, we gather the facts. We apply the law to it, and we see where it takes us. So absolutely, if we had a complaint about um, you know, about Amazon, about here's what's happened, here's what Amazon's doing, here's what kind of conduct Amazon might be, um, might be engaging in, then absolutely, um, we should investigate it and, uh, and, we should, and we should see where it leads us under the law. So that's what I would say. I don't know enough about what they're doing in this regard. Um, and I, because I think the facts um, and the data are so important, to deciding, I can't. I can't make a blanket statement about whether um, about whether an enforcement action is appropriate or not. That's that's my first. That's my first instinct. Jim? Well, look. The I mean, when you talk about content providers, there's a, a lot of focus. I'm, I'm a little surprised to hear about Amazon because there's a lot of focus on the news and Google and Facebook. Yeah. Uh, and. I, I mean, it's not so much an antitrust issue as it is an intellectual property issue. 
I personally think, uh, take an even clearer example, I listen to a lot of music on YouTube. And th those people are not being compensated uh, uh, the way they should be. Uh, those people being the the uh, the, the artists uh, who create the music. Is that an antitrust issue, or that, 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 that's, that's what the, I'm saying? That's the IP issue. Yeah, that's yeah, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It, it, it's there is an issue there, but it's but it's but it's not an antitrust issue now. In 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 many countries, they're moving uh, in the news area to force uh, you know compensation. Of of, uh, of of the news media. Uh, I personally am more aggressive than a lot of people in antitrust law. I would, uh, of, of the big four, uh, I've said this publicly many times, I would sue Google in, you know, for a couple things. Uh, for the most part, uh, this, the point I'm making is this blanket condemnation of of GAFA or however, whatever acronym you want to use uh, doesn't make any sense. These are wildly different companies. Uh, Amazon is a much different company than Apple, uh, and uh, uh, one brush makes no sense in, uh, in talking about all of them. And one of the particularly odd things is when the, is when the uh, uh, Biden administration came in, with its condemnation of big tech, the Trump administration had just brought two big cases against two of the four. And you would have thought that people would have been saying, well, gee, let's see what happens with the cases. And I trust, gee, maybe antitrust law seems to be working. Uh, but, but it's like those cases didn't, you know, didn't even exist. Right, thank you. Other question, right up here, Matt, the gentleman with the mask. Oh, she's gonna bring you a microphone. Mark Tenney, Mathematical Finance Company. Um, in today's market, we have a lot of software vendors sell complicated software to big companies that helps them with their pricing. And the big companies often are afraid to touch anything in the software. They just are afraid to change it. And they often want referrals from, between each other. So you have you know, two big companies or two medium companies are using the same software. They're afraid to change anything. And they refer it to each other. How do you see that as a problem, and how will the neo-Brandeisians see it as a problem? What do you mean by referring to each other? Well, in other words, you want to sell your software to company A, mm -hmm. and they say, we need a referral, so they get it from B. A and B are using your software. They're afraid to change any parameter in the software because it's so complicated, and they're using it to help price their products. OK. Oh, so, oh. so in other words, is that aiding and price fixing? Yeah, so you know, that issue. How would you see it, and how do you think that you should argue? Have you looked at it? No. I, I, look, it, it is the, when you have uh, price exchanges, price disclosures, they can be, uh, this is, may sound like a cop out, but, but you know, they can be both good and bad. When they occur, when they occur in concentration, the more concentrated the market is, the, you know, the more likely you are to be concerned. And, and I, don't, I have no idea what, you know, what the particular fact situation you're talking about is. And one of the analogies might be um, to the airlines years ago that we're all using. Was it called OAG? The, I don't remember. I software. Do remember uh, um, they, they were using something um, so they could all see each other's prices. This is, the, this is one of the areas of antitrust that is um, so tough because it's right on the line. On the one hand, in order to compete aggressively, it's really on price. It's really important to understand competitors' prices. On the other hand, you can't do it by asking your competitor for it, <laughs> right? Um, and and, and we, we respect that line very carefully, right? Because uh, the line between what's aggressive competition and what could move into cartelization is thinner than you'd like it to be. So this, I would say, um, it's not a cop-out, really. It's, it's, it's sort of really, really going to depend on the facts. Um, Sure, uh, that's the way see. antitrust is. But I would think, but I would think, um, I would think, anything today that could uh, have a, at, at a blush look like an antitrust violation, I would get some really good advice on it um, because you asked whether whether we thought the neo brandeisians would look at something like that. Um, certainly, certainly. Uh, mm -hmm. Sounds like something that they might be interested. In. I of course don't know, but. but but it is one of the specific problems with the Robinson-Pamman Act. It was 1979 
in a case with the A&P, that, that, a Supreme Court decision that finally resolved the question of whether, <laughs> of whether you had to, to talk to your competitors uh, about, their, right. about their prices when you know, there's, a, there's a meeting competition defense. And you know, how do you know if you're meeting competition? Well, one way is to, <laughs> is to, is to talk to them about what right. prices they charge. Right. And the FTC actually took the position once upon a time, yeah, you gotta find out. You gotta have an objective basis. Mm -hmm. Well, an objective basis means you talk to them. Right. It was because, nuts. Because your customer is always gonna tell you in order to try to, sure. get, to get the price down, your customer is always gonna tell you, well, I can get X from, right, uh, right. from yeah, Y, yeah, so, yeah. why, so why yeah, you? Yeah, you can't rely objectively yeah. uh, on your customer. One, uh, you know, a, a response to this big, to this general big is bad point. These companies, and Google is one of them, they're great companies, and they're an example of American exceptionalism. I don't think they could have been created any place but uh, except the United States with the stable law that we had in the 40 years. And that stable law included predatory pricing. Uh, if, if, if we'd had a predatory pricing regime like the neo-Brandesians want, a lot of the price steps that Amazon, for, for example, takes, you know, Lena Khan in her article, her famous article that, on which her fame is based, thinks Amazon Prime is predatory pricing. Uh, if, if her view existed, uh, you know, Bezos would have received advice, you know, 20 years ago uh, to be very careful, you know, you know what he did. Uh, and so would a lot of other of these big of, of, of these big companies. And they would have received that advice about harming their competitors. Uh, the model of the ANP, the model that Walmart and Amazon followed and other companies was not good for their competitors. It was good, obviously, for consumers. And if antitrust advice had been to worry about your competitors, then what I'm calling American exceptionalism and allowing these great companies to exist, well, who knows? And it goes back to the original Brandeisians. In 1936, Roosevelt turned populist and ran against the economic royalists. He said their workers were slaves. I'm not making this up. In December 1940, the same Franklin Roosevelt was singing a different tune. And he said, we have to rely on the great arsenal of democracy. Well, the world was, it was, it was a different world in December 1940. Uh, the Japanese and the Germans were on the march. And, it, and ask yourself a question. If Brandeis, if Brandeis had won uh, and, those, and the arsenal of democracy didn't exist, uh, you know, what would have happened in World War II? And, and Tim, you know, what I hear you saying, and it's partly because I know you, so don't let me put words in your mouth, but look, and, and by the way, I agree with you. When I, I, I'm not saying it's wrong for the European Commission to go after those four companies, but I'm, all, I'm, I'm always sort of looking at it with a smile on my face because none of those companies or anything like it starts in Europe, right? So think about that a little bit. But, um, but so it's, it's great, and they have benefited um, consumers and all of us in this country in many, many ways. However, that doesn't mean that they are not subject to the referees of antitrust. Sure. And especially as you get larger, there are certain antitrust laws that are um, that require certain things of you um, because of your now bigger position. It's not that big is bad. It's just that there are certain responsibilities that go along with it. And so it isn't that you don't enforce the antitrust laws against them. You do. Um, but you don't paint them with a bad, with a big brush, and just say, "Well, now that you're that big, and and we we all benefited from your growth and your innovation, now we're just going to say you're bad, and we're going to." Um, no, that's not what we do. What we do is we take a look at their actions and their conduct. We look at the impact uh, it's ultimately having on consumers, and we decide: Can this conduct be allowed to continue, or do we have to change it either structurally, or um, uh, which is usually better, or through some other remedy? So anyway, I didn't mean to put words in your mouth, but no, I, think, I, I, agree. I think we're aligned on that. <laughs> All right, we only have a minute left. I'm going to move to one more question. We'll dispense with, with closing comments. Um, over here, we have a question, Matt. Uh, He's spraying the mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. I'm, I'm loud enough, but um, first of all, I'm going to need another panel to sort out Brandeisian versus Brandeisian, and I just feel I need more clarity. 
Um, <clears throat> okay, so I look at this as a political hack. I look at this as a political problem that found a legal solution. The, uh, our, our Congress is at impasse, it cannot do things. We have a president running for reelection who wants to show action on important things to progressives. Unable to do things in Congress, closest weapon to hand looks like the FTC, and the closest weapon to hand at the FTC looks like Robinson Patman. That's how I see it, but again, I'm not a good person. So, <laughs> the, there will be another election next year, and in that election, the Democrats' map is very, very bad in the Senate. It is the worst map I've ever seen for a party in my professional life. There's a decent chance, if the Republican Party can get its act together, that they could have control of both houses and potentially the presidency. What would, what would Congress do to instruct the FTC, if you could have, if you could wave the wand and make and have Congress enact something, what would Congress do to put the FTC straight? What's the kind of legislation? Who wants to go first? Well, you can start by you can start by repealing uh, by repealing the Robinson Patman Act. I mean that um, that I think that I think could be done. Um, I think um, uh, I think. You know, there's a lot of legislation that's been proposed right now um, that would either really broadly, for example, just prohibit all mergers um, <laughs> of a certain size. It would be efficient, <laughs> I think, if we could agree on how to measure sizes. Um, but, um, and then there's a lot that's more directed at tech that we've been talking about, um, but probably hits a lot of other companies where it's not necessarily intended, so, so, that, so that's sort of an interesting thing. So you could start by, um, I think, stepping back and, um, and, and sorting out, I know it's impossible, but you said if we could wave a wand, and sorting out just some of the, um, some of the politics of this and say, what is broken, what is not working, and look at some of the empirical evidence and, and actually not use some broad brush to say that all of antitrust is broken, but use, um, use more of a scalpel and say, what can we do for the modern economy? Um, and are there things that we could do um, that, would, that would tweak? Um, and uh, um, it's, so I think, I think if, if, if I were the Congress, that's what I would, that's what I would do. And then um, it's an independent agency um, and so, you know, funding is one of the ways that Congress can have some influence over. Um, I don't particularly like uh, Congress directing an agency, um, but if it gets, you know, I think too far out of bounds where um, Congress believes that um, American consumers are really being hurt at a time of great inflation and um, perhaps recession, um, then, you know, perhaps a little more direction is, is needed. But what do you think? Well, I. I think the substantive laws do not need changed. I think there's some remedial things that could help. Most importantly, I think the FTC's ability to get money from fraudsters, which it, which it no longer has, right. uh, would, would, be very, would, would be very useful. It's caught up in a, in a fight where the, where the Democrats want the FTC to be able to get lots of money from everybody in all circumstances, which I think would be, you know, would be a real mistake and would transform the FTC into something completely different. Uh, and there are other small things uh, important to the agency, but, but you know, not, 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 not earth shattering. Look, there are. I, I, you know, suppose someone you know would, would would run against some of these people who attack these companies and say, uh, you know, this guy wants to take your Amazon Prime away from you. I don't know if that would. I mean, I don't know if that would, you know, would matter to to customers, you to consumers, to voters. You have this problem of the people who really don't like these companies care a lot more than the, you know. It's the old typical problem of the the concentrated interests care more than the. Than the, than the voters, I mean, you know, people benefit so much from these, you know, from these companies. You know, you know, maybe somebody could make could make something out of it. I don't know. You're the Chris. You're way more the expert on that than I am. 
All right, well, Deborah and Tim, thank you so much for your insights and, and sharing your experiences with us. And thank you everyone for being here. Uh, please watch for further events on AEI. Share with us your thoughts, your ideas, what else you would like for our scholars to talk about. Thank you very much.